And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. <laughs> I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, Crit, the head, uh, the head honcho of Nerd Burger Games. No, they no, they do not serve. They do not say, serve black bean burgers. Um, yet, <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, and and the the creator of ca the creator of Capers, a whole host of other games, and most recently, the upcoming Good Strong Hands, the one and only Craig Campbell. How you doing today, man? <laughs> good. Hello. How are you? I am do I am doing good. It's been a in it's been a interesting last last few months since the last time I had you on in the temple. Um, aside from aside from the fact that I'm in a new place in a, di in a different township, um, I um, <laughs> I've been I've been using this I've been using this this whole pandemic time to fi to finally start finally start losing weight. Um, and. and I'm down. I'm down to like 250 from 315. So, there's well, good so for you. That. <laughs> um, but of course, of course you've of course you've been keep. You, it looks like you've been keeping yourself busy as well. And so, before we d before we do the deep dive proper, um, what is the elevator pitch when it comes to good strong hands? Oh. Um, Good Strong Hands is a fantasy tabletop role-playing game where you portray fantastic creatures who live in a lovely, pastoral, uh, peaceful, generally, uh, world called Reverie. Mm -hmm. And um, every few centuries, this uh, malevolent force, uh, this uh, personification of, uh, of destruction and entropy called the void tries to come in and destroy your wonderful world and heroes must rise up to uh, stave off the void and save the world and you are one of those heroes in this game right. so when did where did talk talk to me about where the kernel of the of the idea to do this came about was this something that you Always had always had on in in the back of your mind for a while, or was the or was there a recent spark? Well, it was one of those things that I, as I was designing games and doing different things, I found myself thinking, don't think I'm ever going to create like a traditional swords and sorcery kind of mid magic high magic fantasy type game. There's plenty of those out there, um, and like. Uh, like if, if I was going to do a fantasy game at all, it's probably going to need to be something that has a bit of a hook that's a little different, um, something that intrigues me personally. Um, and so that was kind of always in the back of my head. And there's been a few different fantasy game ideas that occasionally kind of bounce to the fore. And I, um, some of them I just kind of toyed with the idea. Some of them I tried designing a little something. And, and um, with this one, it was, um, it was kind of, being nostalgic for for the '80s and specifically for some of the um, kind of uh, lighter, so to speak, um, fantasy films of the '80s and early '90s, um, where and, and not to say that they're all light because, like, a movie like the Never the Never Ending Story has you know has death in it and has um, a darker theme with the the nothing trying to wipe, to destroy everything, mm -hmm. but there was a wasn't Lord of the Rings, right? It wasn't Harry Potter. It was kind of like, well, here's this fantastic world and these interesting people, um, and we only know about them through the movie, so you're just discovering them as you watch the movie. And I kind of just dug on that idea, and I started looking at, like, Legend and uh, The NeverEnding Story and Labyrinth and Willow and some of those movies yeah. and thought, there, there's a game in there. And mm -hmm. so I kind of I took that and just started uh, rolling around with ideas, and it basically turned into this kind of, Lovely, fantastical, sort of fairy tale, but with a darker beat to it because, you know, you are fighting to save your world and mm -hmm. in the process might become corrupted by this this terrible void. Yeah. And when it comes when it comes to when it comes to that, um I do think that I do think that a lot of people underestimate how the um fa the factor of darkness that's within a lot of fairy tales, I think 
I think one I think once you step away from the Disney factor, you'll see a lot of people will see that um fairy tales aren't as light as pe- as people like to think. Like I'd say no, even, me- <laughs> even the Disney factor doesn't apply as much cuz um the Black Cauldron exists. Yeah. Any of them aren't uh if you like you said if you just get away from if you get to the original source material like grim fairy tales are mm-hmm. like there, there's real darkness in a lot of those. Um, some of that Hans Christian Andersen stuff, there's, there's mm-hmm. darkness in there. Um, so it's like they're, they're tales that are sort of meant to entertain and kind of, uh, you know, put a sparkle in the eye of children. But there's also mm-hmm. like oftentimes there's a lesson of something that's kind of built into there. And so they put this kind of nasty, this, this undercurrent of nastiness that's in that story mm-hmm. that also kind of warns children, don't do this or, you know. Um, you know, when you grow up, don't be like this. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, we we too often just think of fairy tales as just like, oh, it's just the fairies and everything's wonderful. Um, yeah, a little bit of darkness to go with the, the bright and cheery. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to... Now, when it comes to the inspirations, you mentioned um, Neverending Story, you mentioned Legend, you mentioned um, Dark Crystal, and I will I will freely note that I am I am still a bit salty that that got canned. Um, <laughs> I know, right before I was about to launch this thing, I was like, ah, because it would have been in the public consciousness that it was getting renewed. Hopefully, I was hoping. Yeah. Um. Um. Labyrinth and and um Willow. Um. It is a bit of an amusing coincidence in re- in regard to Labyrinth, given the um, game book that released earlier this year. Yeah, but there's a there's a Labyrinth game now mm-hmm. with a um, um. I wouldn't I wouldn't co- I wouldn't quite call it an RPG. I'd say it leans I'd say it leans more towards those old game books like Fighting Fantasy, um, with a cute little indent in the pages so that you can put dice in the book. Right. Yeah. They, 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 do, they, they went with like the, there's, there's some cute factor mm-hmm. kind of built in there. And from what I've seen of the system, it's very simple, oh, yeah. um, which is fine because if, if the, the game feels very much geared toward, while it is a game book with lots of words in it, mm-hmm. um, it certainly, it feels like it's, it's geared toward like you could play this with, with kids pretty easily. Yeah. And so, you know, keep the rules uh, relatively simple and just have a couple of, uh, of regular six sided dice so that it's not, anything too out there for somebody to adapt to Mm -hmm. now when it comes to now when it comes to the when it comes to the book i i did see some of the um quick start manuscript um what are you shooting for as far as the size are you think are you thinking no bigger than 200 pages um, it's looking to be, assuming all goes well with the Kickstarter, with where I think we'll end up, mm-hmm. um, it's looking to be 144 pages. Um, and I actually had somebody ask me relatively recently, because I, I described the game as rules light. And I was like, yeah, but that that's the rules are like 14 pages at six by nine. So once you remove graphics and illustration, it's like 12 pages, which is really like a six page rule book at eight and a half by 11. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty rules light when you think of it kind of from that yeah. uh, direction. But that's because, and then the page count then blows up because there's, you know, there's the introductory stuff and kind of world stuff and there's GM advice and so forth um, and all sorts of uh, two page adventure layouts for, for GMs to use. And there's, and, and the, the character creation and everything has its own little chapter. Plus mm-hmm. characters are on two page playbooks. So if you've got 12, um, different character playbooks. That's twenty-four pages out of those hundred and forty-four. So, yeah. but but rules-wise, it's it's you know, it's no and, worse than like six pieces of paper. And the um, I did find the I did find the playbook setup interesting for the same reason I've al- I've always found that setup interesting in um, Powered by the Apocalypse, where you essentially have the char- character sheet as we traditionally understand it and character advancement all in one package. Yeah, everything that your character could become is on that two-page playbook. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the, like the one half of the the playbook is all the kind of more general stuff. You've got your traits and 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 stuff that you fill in about your name and appearance and some other things. Um, and then 
and some things to track like your conditions and so forth. Um, and then the other page is full of all sorts of different in the game. They're referred to as talents. They're, mm -hmm. they're like your character special abilities. Yeah. Um, and then there's also corruptions, which are like if your character goes a little dark and gains some of these like nasty powers that the void grants. Um, and every playbook has a completely unique set of uh, talents and corruptions. So mm -hmm. nobody, nobody playing another playbook is going to steal your thunder for these special things that your character can do. Yeah. Um, how many pl how many playbooks do you s do you see there being in the f being in the full book? Um, assuming all goes well, there should be twelve. Twelve, and. On the Kickstarter page, you showed the Wildkin as one of the examples. Are there are there a few um, other playbooks that you that you could mention to kind of showcase what the um, potential there is? Sure. Um, yeah, the Wildkin is on the on the Kickstarter page, and they are like anthrop anthropomorphic uh, uh, small mammal people. Like mm -hmm. so, you've got you know, like fox Wildkin and, and badger Wildkin and so forth. Yeah. Um, there's also um, Oh, let's see. There's brownies that um, some of these were kind of built in. We're, we're ready to go into the game to begin with. And some of them, we expanded the book through stretch goals by um, getting more money so that we can do more artwork and stuff. So some of these don't have artwork on the page, but like brownies, um, uh, which are kind of like, your, yeah, your help helper, still sort of mischievous soil spirits. Um, fawns, which are, you know, you're kind of trip traditional goat people that have a penchant for performance. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what else we got. There's uh, imps, which are like mildly devilish and they kind of have a, a dark ass that they're trying to, to shed um, pixies, which are pretty much what, like you think they'll be red caps, which are a little bit, uh, they're a little, a little more surly, a little, uh, they, some people think they're kind of violent, but they're, they're uh, they're sort of misunderstood. Um, Stonekin, which are uh, like rock people, <laughs> rock you know stone elemental type, earth elemental type creatures. Um, sylphs, which are air spirits, mm -hmm. uh, and woodkin, which are uh, that's that, that's your Groot, that's your uh, your your tree person. Um, and then there's also human um, is available, and in the game. Uh, Reverie is not home to any native humans. There are there's not there's no communities or towns full of humans living there. When you play a human in in good strong hands, you are from Earth, mm -hmm. and you have traveled to Reverie, sort of like uh, um, Bastion does at the end of Dar uh, uh, Never Ending Story, mm -hmm. um, or um, now I can't believe I'm blanking on her name from Labyrinth, um, Sarah. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll check I'll check on I'll check on that later and if I, need I, be, I, I'll, if need be I'll add, I'll add a it's I'll add, I'll add a I'll add a correction and then and then it's, pick, it's and then Sarah. pick on my <laughs> for, uh, accordingly. Yeah. <laughs> I quick I looked at it real quick. Sarah Williams, yeah. Jennifer Connelly's character. Um, so yeah, you play a human. If you play a human, you're you're an outsider and sort of a curiosity rather than. Like in, in a lot of fantasy store uh, or fantasy RPGs, you know, humans are are oftentimes the uh, the most prevalent um, and yeah. widespread of of the folk that you can play. Where here humans are kind of oddities. Yeah, and now when it comes to the now in the bullet points for the Kickstarter page, it mentions a thematic minor magic system. Um, when I when I read that. One of the things that ended up coming to mind is the insistence on subtle magics, or the magic is everywhere. It's just not. It's just not, not always overt in the traditional sense that you'd see in certain certain um, Tolkien esque works. Is that the approach that you're going with with the magic system here? Um, essentially, the yeah, the magic is like the world is magical, mm -hmm. and the characters, the the different playbooks have. Um, access to some talents that are specifically defined as being magic. Um, but there's not like great big spell books. There's, uh, there's, there's not a lot of high magic, really big flashy kind of stuff. Nobody's teleporting across the world or um, in the train, everybody. Um, nobody's, uh, you know, blowing things up with gigantic fireballs or meteor swarms or anything. Um, but the world is kind of magical. And if you were, 
if you if you if you're playing one of these characters and you take uh, one of the talents that gives you um, th that is a magic talent, it will oftentimes have a realm of magic that's associated with it. Mm -hmm. And so when you take when you've done that, you can create you can generate magical effects in sort of a free form system that um, relates to that realm of magic. So you can do like you might have emotion magic. So you might be able to make, you know, do um, manipulate emotions through magic. Um, and uh, what that boils down to is, is making it uh, d basically describing what you want to do with the magic. And the, the thing that you want to do has to be something that you could do with one of the other trait checks. Like if you're going to make a body check for something physical or a mind check for something intellectual or a charm check for something social, something that you could do anyway, but you're going to do it with magic and you make a heart check instead. Um, and so it's, it's really about like coming up with interesting ways to like, well, what are all the different ways I can use emotion magic? What sorts of effects can I get out of that? Um, and then, you making the heart check to accomplish that rather than defaulting to um, one of the other traits. Yeah. And when it comes now, when it comes to the intent, when it comes to the intensity dial, um, like when I saw, when I saw that something I ended up being reminded of is the campaign modifiers I see in fantasy craft. Um, how is it go is how is it more of a difficulty slider when it comes when it comes to intensity dial or how is it going how is that going to work in context okay um let's back up we'll talk about how trait checks work all right um you've got four traits as i kind of listed earlier mm -hmm. you've got body mind charm and heart all right um and each of those will be ranked 1 through 4 4 being uh the highest you know a, a higher is better um, if you're going to attempt something, you're going to, you know, you'll describe what you're doing. You'll look at, look to the uh, the trait that's most applicable mm -hmm. and roll a number of D6s equal to that trait score. Um, shooting for a target number of four, five, or six set by the GM. Yep. Um, and you're trying to get at least one of your dice to hit or exceed that target number mm -hmm. in order for you to be successful. If you fail on the check um, and none of your dice hit the target number, you um, uh, you fail at what you're doing. The GM can introduce a complication, and you mark one box on a skill track. There's a track that has ten check boxes called skill. Mm -hmm. um, if you fill up the skill track, you erase every all the checks, and you advance your character in some way. So basically, you um, you advance your character through failure. All right. So you learn from failure, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you succeed with exactly one die hitting the, the target number, um, you, you succeed at what you were attempting, and you mark a spirit, and that's a separate track. Yep. Um, and spirit is a currency in the game that you can spend um, on various things, including gaining extra dice. Um, some talents require that you spend spirit, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you succeed with two or more dice hitting the target number, you uh, you're successful at what you're doing. You gain a boon, which means like you know something happens better, so you can describe a greater success, or the GM can help to describe that. Um, and you mark one on um, a track called Shadow. Um, shadow reflects the 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 void trying to corrupt you because when you perform something really well, when you are very skilled, when you show that you can be a hero, the void notices you. And so it plants these seeds of shadow in you. And if you fill up your shadow track, you erase everything um, and gain a corruption. Uh, and if you gain all of the corruptions over the course of a campaign and then fill your shadow track again, your character falls to the void and you cease to play them. Mm -hmm. um, they, become, uh, they become a fallen or cursed character, um, an agent of the void. Mm -hmm. um, until... The, uh, until your friends manage to find some way to redeem you. <laughs> yeah. um, and so then with that all in mind, you've got those three tracks. Mm -hmm. the intensity dial is how long you make those tracks. There's 10 spots on the character sheet, uh, on the character sheet, but they can be that those tracks can be as short as five. So if you want a game where characters are going to 
um, advance quickly. You could set your intensity, set the, set the uh, 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 skill track to only have five boxes. So you fill in five boxes permanently. If you want um, to limit how much um, spirit people can stockpile for potential use later, you could you could shorten up the spirit track. If you want characters to walk that dark line and potentially fall um, to the void faster, you can shorten up the shadow track. So you could set, that's the intensity dial. You could set those tracks at different lengths depending on the kind of game you want. And speak, speaking of that, since you mentioned the shadow track, I did I did want to ask about that. Now, obvious obviously, the more that the more um, that increases, the the more down the uh, dark path that you end up going. Um, but within, and I this might be a bit spoilery, but within <laughs> the rule set, and you don't have to go into detail if you don't want to. Are there means to recover to recover from it? Um, to well, there's there's a number of ways you can mitigate the shadow situation. Um, whenever you are going to mark shadow from a trait check, mm -hmm. you can spend uh, spend one spirit to not mark shadow. All right. So you can make the choice to resist the darkness. All right. Um, in in the moment. Uh, if you do allow yourself to kind of go down that road and gain a corruption, there is a way to buy off the corruption, but it is expensive. Um, it costs uh, spending a bunch of points. It probably, if the GM is uh, crafty, it's probably like uh, like some some form of quest or like significant um, action or thing that you need your character needs to do to kind of wrest themselves away from the void. Mm -hmm. um, and you also permanently fill in two boxes on your shadow track. So once you've tasted corruption, it's easier for you to become corrupted again. It's basically the idea. So that like yeah. you can buy yourself back off of it, but you're going to make that shadow track shorter. All right, I can I can get that. Um now when now on some of the on some of the talents I did see that you had um that you had certain tags Within um parent within parentheses, I'm guess mm -hmm. now the one th the one that seemed that seemed a a bit obvious is the a is the a tag. I'm guessing that's for um actions. Any any talent or corruption mm -hmm. that has an a in parentheses after it, that that one counts as your action. If you use that talent or corruption, it's your action for, for the turn. Right. Um, many many of the talents and corruptions are simply, they're modifiers to things that you're otherwise doing, they're just general qualities that your character has, or they're like minor things that you could technically do very quickly yeah. um, w without too much thought. But anything, you know, anything big that's, you know, usually, generally, like if it's got an A, if it counts as an action, it's kind of a big effect. Mm -hmm. Um. I also see that we have conditions instead of using a traditional health approach. Um, how is how is that condition track going to going to work out in play? If uh, well, now the, the the system is entirely player facing. The the players roll dice. The GM never does. All right. So um, when you're making checks, if you're any basically any time that something bad could happen to you based on how the rules work. You might be you might find yourself marking a condition. So if you're making if you're you know characters in a fight and you're making a body check and you fail at it, well the result of that is there's a complication that the GM can introduce and that could be to mark one physical condition. So you move one track one one box along that physical track. Um, if uh, you know if if there's like an effect that comes into play, maybe it's it's something that you have to react to. Um, you know, like like your characters are sneaking through um, a darkened, a dark place, a dark wood, and there's you know really, you know that there are very scary ghosts that live in this wood, and they you know the the, the ghosts jump out at you and attempt to scare you. You can make a heart check to resist that, um, and if you if you fail at that um, that resistance check, then you might mark one uh, check on the emotional side of the addition track mm -hmm. um and so you could you can have emotional and physical 
effect you know, negatives basically affecting you at at, the, at a given time. Now there's there's penalties that become associated with that for dice rolls, but you always only take the worst of the two, so it doesn't become a spiral <laughs> where if you have taken both uh, types of conditions um, to a to a higher degree, you're, like you're completely screwed. Mm -hmm. uh, you just you just deal with the worst of the two, and then it also gives you um, by by having it not just be number based and having it being d kind of description based because all of the conditions are things like. Um, uh, 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 you know, afraid, um, injured, broken. You know, there's there's, there's mm -hmm. descriptive things. So you, it'll give you a guideline for like, you know, are your is your character just unsettled a little bit, or are they truly terrified? Yeah. Um, based on how far they've gone down that emotional track. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, one of the, one of the things that I saw that I saw in the um, sh in the sheet regarding dice rules that I was curious about is the concept of advantage. Um, the, the, the game does away with, uh, there's, there's no, there's no like plus twos, minus twos, all that sort of thing. It's all based on like just how many dice you're rolling. Yeah. So if you are in a position um, or in a, some sort of a situation that is advantageous to you, you gain one die. Um, for your die roll. And if you are in some sort of disadvantageous position, you lose a die. Um, yeah. If you if you have advantage and disadvantage, they cancel each other out. Um, you can never have advantage or disadvantage from more than one source. So you can't like have double secret advantage or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, so it's just, it's a way to account for, you know, kind of everything else. So I don't have to have an equipment list. But let's say you've got a magic sword. The GM has given has you know made a magic sword available to your character at some point. I don't need a bunch of stats to go with that. I just know that when you use the magic sword, you have advantage because it's a magic sword. Yeah. Um. And in and within that within that now you mentioned that the tar that the target number is either going to be um, four, five, or six when it comes to when it comes to the roll. Hmm? Would I be correct in assuming that? Regardless of of the of uh, that number, the the goal is that you only need one die to to hit in order to have that action count as a success. There's no minimum success threshold approach. Um, no, there's if you if you if one if at if at least one die hits, you succeed. If more than one die hit, you succeed better. Yeah. So and given the fact that you mentioned that this is a forward facing kind of game. The GM is probably going to just is probably going to decide whether or not it's four, five, or six to pass. Right. The GM, it's uh, it's essentially there's there's basic guidelines in the GM section that kind of talk about like generally speaking, fours and fives are good for most of the checks that you're going to have people make. Um, don't use sixes too much because sixes are really hard to roll because you know only one result on the die gets you a six, whereas two or three results gets you a four or five. Um, so like the, the it's the, the advice is there that like use sixes but use them sparingly and for only for like the really remarkable um things that the characters are going to attempt when they like when they're dealing with the most difficult situation. Yeah. Um and when it and the other, the other thing and, and and obviously with this I'm look, I'm looking at the example um playbook with with Wildkin what what are um, fears and anchors, and how would and how would they interact with the system? Um, fears are just things that your character fears. Like mm -hmm. normally, they live in this lovely idyllic world, but when the um, when the void shows up, they have things to be afraid of. Um, and in in game, uh, basically, the, the the fears are there for the GM to have personal challenges. You know, so if your character is afraid of, uh, you know just for simplicity's sake, big lizards. Um, you know, like if they run up against, they run up against a big snake or a big lizard person or a dragon or something like that, they, uh, they're, they're afraid. It's something that they don't do well with. So they will suffer disadvantage um, while they're dealing with that. But when they overcome their fear, um, uh, or, or, you know, when they face it at least or uh, overcome, it, overcome it in that moment, um, they should be rewarded with a little something like they might gain it. The, the disadvantage goes away and maybe they gain advantage on the next thing that they try to do because like, you know, look at me. I, you know, I overcame um, dealing with this, uh, this dragon thing. And so now when I 
go to uh, rescue the princess or whatever. Um, I've got uh, this uh, extra, uh, this little boost. Like mm -hmm. so, you've got advantage. Um, anchors are essentially just uh, character. They're 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 descriptors. They're adjectives um, that describe your character. And the idea is that they are generally good, beneficial. You would you know, you'll choose anchors from like positive descriptors as opposed to negative stuff because the game is kind of inherently hopeful and kind of assumes the characters are heroes and really good people. Um, and you can use the anchors in play to, uh, to, if you exemplify one of your anchors, if you really play true to type, um, you can gain a spirit, um, for doing that. Um, and you can gain a spirit from each anchor once per session. So it's, it's there to encourage you playing true to the character and doing those heroic, wonderful things and being good. Um, and also from a mechanical standpoint, um, they're there to help you make sure that you can get some spirit, even if your dice rolls don't get you um, that one perfect success. Because normally you gain spirit by getting only one die. Like if you if you just if you're just doing nothing but failing or getting all the dice to hit, like suddenly you're never gaining any spirit. Yeah. Um, because you need exactly one die for spirit. So it's it's another way to gain spirit. Yeah. And when it. One thing I'm one thing I'm uh, cu I'm curious about is was you're using now you're using a d6 die pool which um is certainly not your first rodeo when it com when it comes to using that setup but was the reason you went with that particular die for this just to, just um for accessibility's sake since everybody probably has some d6s even if they have to dig through their copy of Monopoly to do it Absolutely. <laughs> Everybody's got a pile of D6s. If you're a role player and you've played D&D, &D, you've got at least 10 D6, I guarantee you. Mm -hmm. um, because everybody's throwing a big fireball. Um, now, uh, and, 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 you know, like I said, like you said, too, like even if you're, like, if you're introducing somebody to a game and you're going to play this and this is a, a good game, it's like, here are your characters all on these, just these two pages. That's all you need. Well, what do I need? I need dice. What kind of dice do I need? The kind of dice you have in every board game. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, real simple. Yeah, and of course, and there's a there's already enough of a culture around these around these six sided dice that that it's not going to be too hard to get it. And well, you can buy them anywhere. You can buy it at the you can buy uh, six sided dice at the gas station. Yeah, next to the playing cards. And well, well, getting d six is not going to be hard for somebody like me because um, I play a fair amount of Shadowrun, so I have d sixes <laughs> for days. <laughs> you are you are bathing in d6s right now yeah um i, rem I remember some i remember somebody asking me do when i when i ended up getting one of those chess x pound of dice setups which is actually a really good deal for what you get um yes don't you have enough don't you have enough dice no <laughs> <laughs> i i have um i have recollections of playing shadow run um and other games too that used like D6 pools, but it came up in Shadowrun too, where we were like playing Shadowrun and everybody had like a whole bunch of D6s. And like the, the running joke at the table was every every so often somebody would be like, somebody got a D6 I can borrow. And you look at the table and it's just nothing but D6s. They're everywhere. Did anybody get an extra D6? Yeah, I had, um, I had, I had legit, I had legitimately th thought of seeing if I could dig around to see, to find, to find some sort of, um, I don't know, six sided slot like thing just to just to save space on the table because I'm pretty <laughs> sure you I'm pretty sure you have the same off the table rule that I have. If the die rolls off the table, it doesn't count. Doesn't count. Get it back up here where I can see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. I um I ended up I ended up buying a a handful of wide plastic bowls for the sake of my sanity. <laughs> sure. I had I had a player who was notorious for rolling their dice kind of rather than dropping them straight down on the table like rolling them like the the arm move the arm motion was parallel to the tabletop and would mm -hmm. roll dice off the table all the time. Yeah, I think some I think somebody like that needs um I, I don't know one one of those bingo rollers to do to do the <laughs> job for them. Got to get her a dice tray. Yeah. <laughs> um like I I had set up the bulls just just to say, okay, if it's if it's not in the bull, roll it again. <laughs> Even if it lands on the table, I don't care. 
Um, <laughs> and when it comes, and when it, given the fact that you mentioned not wanting to do a equipment list, I'm get, I'm guessing that was also for the sake of keeping things simple and for the sake of sanity, since. If you had to do an equipment list, that'd mean you'd also have to do prices, and this is too abstract for that. Yeah, there's no money in this game. Um, the 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 there's there's a bunch of things that came out of the simple idea that I wanted the game to be simple, mm -hmm. and I wanted it to be as you know as low impact and and work well as a as an online game like you can just get on a zoom call you don't need a whole bunch of other stuff so you like the idea is like literally once you know the rules players have a two-page character sheet gm has a two-page um story scheme which is you know basically an adventure outline mm -hmm. and that's all you don't have maps and minis to manage nobody has to be flipping through equipment lists or spell lists um you don't have like the the, the gm doesn't have to um prep and manage a whole bunch of stat blocks um, there's not multiple source books to be flipping through. It's it's very simple. Um, so like you just you sit down at a co convention and start playing without having to dig through a lot of stuff. You can play online with like here's my piece of paper that I need, and that's all I need, and my dice. Yeah. And one of the things that was also mentioned on the page is story schemes, which mm -hmm. I look I look at that and I s and I think of plot I think of um plot seeds. Is that the general idea with how story schemes are um, set up? Uh, the basically, it's just a, it's a it's an adventure outline. Mm -hmm. So rather than having an adventure that's like, well, here's 16 pages that goes into a great deal of detail yeah. about the adventure. Um, here's here's uh, the name of the adventure. Here's a little bit of background to kind of set things up. Here's what the adventure is about. What the characters have to do. Um, and then there's just a whole bunch of story elements that are inspiration. Here's questions you can ask the players to help kind of build out their characters and the the setting and where you are because the, the game presupposes a lot of um, cooperative world building. Um, and then here's like interesting locations. Here's uh, NPCs and monsters and things that you might run into. And then the types of challenges that you might be up against um, with uh, one or two of those um more significant challenges being given um, a little more of an in-depth treatment with some more complexity and things. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's like a little epilogue at the end that kind of tells you, okay, and this is what happens when the characters succeed or yeah. fail. Um, and so the, 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 the GM can just like, they can read that and kind of have that ready to go in, in a matter of a few minutes and just improvise and, and take character suggestions and, and let players make choices that will lead them to different places and just find the way that the character, find the way that the story resolves itself. Mm -hmm. Um, there, you know, like it, very few of the adventures in here, very few of these story schemes have very specific, like this is how the characters have to do exactly this thing in order to quote unquote win. Right. Mm -hmm. There's, there's usually like the characters can succeed at their uh, uh, at saving these people by doing this, this, or this, or it's left kind of open and it's just like you know like we we all know stories we all know how to make up a story like when the players and the GM are telling a story there comes a point where like well you're you're trying to make sure a music festival happens there's all sorts of problems well so you go around and you solve problems and you solve problems and maybe there's a few kind of big moments. Um, that are sort of climactic. And then there's there's just a point. I don't need to tell you mm -hmm. all the things you need to do to make sure the music festival happens and that you're successful at that. Like everybody just kind of understands, oh, well, yeah. at this point, we've pretty much got it under control. This is the end of the story. We don't need to belabor it any further. And yeah. then you can kind of have a wrap up and an epilogue. And um, As a quick aside, you, ju you just ended up putting a terrible idea in my head of a... Of a <laughs> Of a fairy tale version of the original Blues Brothers, <laughs> um, which which may be which may even be too terrible for my table, and that's saying something. Um, but the but the way you describe it, would it be fair of me to say that in that um a lot of those story schemes are kind of in a um act structure. Um, not specifically. Um, you can, there's, if you look, when you look at the list of challenges that are available, there's 
probably some like you'll look at a list of like there might be like eight challenges or nine or something and you'd be like oh this is clearly like like this challenge here feels like it would be like a turning point in the story um so maybe that like you know when you get to that challenge that's sort of you know the end of an act quote unquote mm-hmm. um but they're they're not specifically laid out that way um but you know if 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 you're being clever and everybody's kind of um kind of knows like storytelling and like the tropes of storytelling and we all do we don't necessarily have them quantified in our head we can't necessarily write a an essay about it but we all kind of know like mm-hmm. here's the point where things really get dire here's the point where things to start to turn for the better you know we know where the act breaks yeah. are um that you can kind of make those things happen just based on whatever challenge seems appropriate to doing that kind of in the moment based on the story you've constructed. Yeah. And part of, part of the reason I bring up that kind of thing is I, I have to adjust accordingly with my table because, well, if it wasn't, if it wasn't clear, if it wasn't clear from my accent and bad jokes, I'm from Minnesota, the (laughs) same home, the same home of mystery science theater. Sure. And because of that, my table has, um, a bit of riff quality in it, because sure. everybody in there is some is somewhat gen- is somewhat genre savvy. But they're not going to just let it lie when when you throw out something that begs for a joke. They're gonna they're gonna hit the joke. Yes, um, <laughs> and be- because of that, there's some games that I won't run with them because I know it wouldn't be compatible. But in a <laughs> lot of the in a lot of these sort of situations, I um. Instead, instead of instead of trying to fight against it, why try to swim up river when you can just when you can just um you can just let them do all, do half do half of the work for you and add and add to the insanity. Because sure. it's not it's not like it, it's not like any plan goes swimmingly, anyways. Oh, you can't plan. <laughs> you can you can plan, but you know a lot of what you plan for isn't necessarily going to go quite the way you expected it to. Absolutely. Yeah. Rule Rule Nineteen of combat is intelligence is always wrong. Um, Murphy's Law of rendition of that, like, uh, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Yeah. Um, and what? Now I'm get I'm guessing that within that um, within the GM end of things, there's going to be a bit a bit of a um, bestiary. I can never figure out if it's bestiary or bestiary. I always hear I think both. Tec- I, I I'm I'm confused to it often. I think it's technically supposed to be pronounced bestiary. Mm-hmm. Um, English language, it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. But there's there's not a specific uh, like. There's a list of monsters, yeah, um, that are provided for you with like it's like literally a bullet point. Here's one line of like this kind of monster and a very brief description of what it's like. Yeah, um, let me let me find it. I can actually read a couple of them. But there's not like stat blocks or pages of monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, I gotta find the. Well, come on. It was like you know, doppelgangers, mm-hmm. bipedal shapeshifters that can mimic anyone. Um, ghosts, the spirits of folk who have died, still bound to rubbery. So it, mm-hmm. like that's the extent of the description of, of monsters. Yeah. Um, I guess part of the reason I ended up thinking of that is it is um there was the there was the whole talk of a dragon, which um could pro- would certainly be interesting in the in this context because I'd say it, I'd say it'd be the I'd say it'd be the equivalent of why people were scared of smog in the in the Hobbit because for all intents and purposes it's a walking talking nuclear weapon basically to the point that the um the strategy battle game if you were fielding smog that's the only thing you could field because you don't need anything else sure. Um, and I I did see that you guys have that um one of the support materials you guys are working on is a creative folk PDF. Um. Now, wi- now, obviously, we can't go into all the all the guidelines at the at this point. But what are what are some general do's and don'ts when it comes to cr- when it comes to creating folk? Oh. This is a this is a question I've not been asked. Fun. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I need to put the guidelines together. I kind of know what they are in my head, you mm-hmm. know. 
um, when I was when I was designing the folk, like the big thing about designing um, a new folk, a new a new race, a new, a new character type in the game is the talents and corruptions, um, because that's what really di- differentiates them for the most part. And um, so they're like, I'll ha- there'll be a list of like these are the types of things that you might see as a talent that just is a talent that like mm-hmm. you select it and now you have it. These are the types of things that. Um, you should have people spend uh, a spirit for um, because it's a more powerful effect, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, guidelines for like every folk that has magic has um, uh, at least, well, there's, there's one or two exceptions, but most of the the folk have like at least like two types of magic, give them two types of magic so that there are options because the world is magical and these creatures are magical. Um, Every folk has, um, like three of the talents require spending spirit. So don't create folk where you have to spend spirit for everything. Don't create folk where you never spend spirit. Like, you know, mm-hmm. pick three talents, make three talents where you specifically spend spirit to get the better, you know, a, a greater effect. So that way, because the idea there is that you're creating, um, you could, you could create two different characters in the same, of the same folk where one is like heavy on the spirit talents um, and one isn't, and so they become very different characters in what their capabilities are. And one player, who ha- the player who's playing the character that has to spend a lot of spirit, will be spending their spirit to use those talents, and the other mm-hmm. character, the other player, will be spending their spirit to increase die rolls. So they'll have a, a, a like playing the character will be a different experience. Yeah, I can, de- and I can definitely get behind that. Um, when it comes to and when it when it comes to the no, the um, notion the notion of spirit spending abilities and non spirit spending abilities, um, I realize this might be a bit tricky to get into specifics. But where would you say the line is between the two of them? Um, boy, that's tough. That's that's going to be one of the things that I like. I just kind of had a feeling when I was creating stuff mm-hmm. um, that I'm going to need to examine more closely, but I'm just going to like, let me look at a plate, one of the early playbooks that mm-hmm. like something that you spend a spirit on. Oftentimes um, if, if it's going to heal anybody, um, if it's going to um, like, if it's going to save your butt in some way, um, you'll be a spirit um, if it's going to if it's going to create an effect that's going to effectively completely remove an NPC from a situation or from being a threat um, or you or just you know like change them in a very significant way like there's a pix the pixies have a, a, a talent called slumber sleep which they spend a spirit to perform a dance and make a creature fall asleep Mm -hmm. Um, like when you make a creature fall asleep, like, okay, you're trying to sneak in somewhere. There's a guard, you make them fall asleep. They're out of the equation. Like that solves all of your problems, that guard. So like anything that like solves a big problem, like kind of entirely, um, is spirit based. Um, if it's something that is just like, kind of like a little perk, that's nice. Um, but it doesn't necessarily solve problems for you. It just helps you along the way. Then it doesn't acquire spirit. Mm -hmm. And I'm get and when it com- when it comes to and when it comes when it comes to any sorts of um ta- of towns that would require ma- that would um be magical. I'm guessing it's in the same vein where if it is able to give you a significant enough edge, then it would be a spirit spender. Uh, yeah, same basic thing. Yeah, like magic is like making something a magic talent versus not a magic talent is flavor than anything um like looking at the pixie for example the circle of flowers is um it's it's a way to heal to remove conditions from characters in some you know you might call that healing magic for pixies it's just a thing they do so it's not specifically magic whereas they have an uh, an ability where they can create um they can transform into a transform themselves into a firefly and they can fly very fast and create light that illuminates a big area. Well, then now that's light magic. Cause that like, it, that it just feels bigger. Mm-hmm. feels like, well, that has to be like channeling some sort of energy in order to create that light. Whereas like a pixie is like, you know, well, they're nice and helpful and well, sure. Why couldn't they make a, a fairy circle where you can 
where you can rest and heal. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's, there's, it, it, you could argue that like a lot of these abilities <laughs> are, are magic. Um, but, uh, like the, the the ones that I made to be magic versus the ones that aren't really magic, even though you could technically assign a magical effect to them, it's kind of a, f- a flavor thing. Mm-hmm. It just there's there's things that felt right and things that felt like okay, it just makes sense for this, and that's just and that's there's no quote unquote sorry magic to that decision. There's just you know it's like what felt right to me when I was designing how that folk is going to function. And so it'll be the same for you. If you want to create a folk from the ground up, you'll be like, okay, well, I'm just like the character can do this thing. If they have this talent, um, I'm not going to call it specifically magic, but this, this one over here, we're going to call that specifically magic. And that that's going to open it up to doing minor magics and the heart check and all that other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, now when it comes to, when it came to um, magic checks, um, like when I was go- when I was going through the quick start, I'd I'd saw that um, there isn't one specific trait that's dedicated to ma- that's dedicated to magic. And what I'm curious about is what sort what sort of magical effects would favor um, different traits. Um, like oh, like as far as like kind of mimicking what other traits could do. More, more or less, like what what sort of magical effects would favor body? What sort would favor charm? That kind of thing. Um, well, are we are we talking? I just want to be clear. Are we talking like magical effects? Like in, with with the the minor magic system, mm-hmm. basically, you're just you're whatever you can imagine, whatever you yeah. can make up. So, like as an example, I was talking about emotion magic earlier. Mm-hmm. You could like let's say you wanted to. Um, distract somebody um, so that your friend could you know sneak behind him or something um, you could use you could make a body check in order to like you know throw a rock over there and get their attention and make them look that way right so that'd be a body check to like kind of get make a loud enough noise that's going to get their attention you could make a charm check by to talk to them um, and get them kind of focused on you so they're not paying attention to everything else that's going on around them um, but then you could use emotion magic and make a heart check to um, fill their mind with um, like overwhelming emotion. They're suddenly like just like, they're 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 flooded with like every emotion, and so like that 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 will distract somebody, right? If somebody is suddenly just like overcome with all of these emotions, it's going to kind of get them catch them off guard. And so in that moment, that character is distracted because you filled their you flooded their mind with emotion. Mm-hmm. And with now with with that with that kind of thing and with that kind of thing in mind, um, so you had initially set this at a three thousand dollar goal, and congratulations on completely smashing that <laughs> three times over. Thank um, you. Since it's now it's now at some um, ten point four thousand with twelve with twelve days to go now. Now, um, we've there's been the whole notion of a su- of presum- presuming every presuming everything goes proper. So in the in lieu of not jinxing, <laughs> there we go. Um, but what what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking first quarter twenty twenty one? Um, well, I've got May of twenty twenty one listed as the reward. Um. Or what, what do they call it in there? Usually, it's the estimated delivery May of 2021. Um, that kind of has a buffer built into it. Like I know there's a certain amount of artwork that needs to get done yet. Um, the artwork is actual painting artwork, so it takes longer. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so there's that. There's you know laying out the whole book, and then there's the process of dealing with proofing and getting print. You know, um, and whether it's a, if if it's a print run versus print on demand, depending on how everything goes. Um, there's, there's logistical stuff to work in there. So a 2021, I feel is very, very, very doable. Um, barring some sort of unforeseen circumstance, like the artist suddenly, you know, can't work on the art ever. <laughs> like, um, it, my hope is to have the rest of the art by the end of the year. 
Um, and I've talked to the layout guy and um, Todd is, is, is aware of that plan. So the hope there is to have layout squared away with placeholder images by the end of the year. So it really just becomes swapping in the artwork. And then so early next year, it'll be dealing with printing, proofing, all that kind of stuff and getting it out. So, you know, conceivably, um, it could happen in the first couple of months um, next year, but mm -hmm. um, it, might, it, might, it might roll into like March or April depending on um, the timing of, of everything. Yeah, I can get I can get that. And given what you mentioned about the artist, I got to do it again. <laughs> Look, I learned a long time ago never to tempt irony. Especially since there's always that one person at the table who think who thinks, "Ah, this is a low difficulty roll. I'll be, I'll be fine." Rolls nothing but ones. <laughs> You're a sucker. <laughs> Never assume that. Yeah. Not not unless you not unless you like having a bad time because you will have a bad time. Eventually, it's just odds are some sometime you're going to have a bad a bad run. Well, it just happens. Well, that and the dice gods are a model example of equality because it does <laughs> not it does not matter your political affiliation, race, gender, sex, sexual orientation. Height, oh. weight, blood type. The dice gods hate you. <laughs> and I know somebody might say, but but I rolled snake eyes that one time. That was them giving you a reprieve. Yeah. But I rolled um, a one twice or I rolled I rolled a one on a D twenty twice in a row, so I'm I'm due for a better roll. No, you're not. No. Just like like even looking at it from a statistical point of view, the dice doesn't care what the history of the rolls are a chance that you'll roll that one 50 times in a row every time you roll the die every time you roll a die there's a chance there's a chance you're going to roll a one mm -hmm. which uh, and of of course there's of course there's no there's no there's no playing there's no playing favorites and especially at my tail because because i'm going to know if somebody tried rigging their die and then they're going to have to deal with one of the punishments <laughs> That's what I keep. That's why I keep the pain glass in the back. You cheat on dice, you gotta you gotta drink from the pain glass. Okay. I just I just figure the punishment should fit. I just figure the punishment should fit the crime. I used to do. I used to break that out when, during board game nights when people got caught cheating. Mm. Um, it's not. It's not. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing Major, it's just, it's just it's just a shot glass full of bacon soda. <laughs> it's one of those things that you would get that you would get in a um, specialty candy shop just to pull just to pull this kind of thing. Sure, but <laughs> look, it, look, crazy things happen at tables. Um. But when now, I do now because because of the fact that I've had it as a running gag for the last seven years, I do I do have to ask the uh, the obvious question. Even even with a light page size, will the book still have an index? Absolutely. There you go. No doubt. <laughs> I realize that was a bit of a left field question, but it's what it. Well, some some people forget to put an index in. Oh, I've got a page set aside for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or yeah, or you have the Palladium problem where the index and table of contents are nothing but lies. <laughs> yeah. I I hope that there will be an index with actual words and page numbers. That's mm -hmm. the plan. Yeah, that's the goal. But I'll definitely be keep, I'll definitely be keeping a close eye on how, on how how it how it turns out and as and um. At the time of the, at the time of this recording, it's got twelve days to go. I'm ho I'm hoping against hope that the that um the next sorry about that I got thrown off by the sirens um the that the next stretch goals for adamants and paragons gets at, gets um added in before then. Um, um yeah, that's that's the hope. I think I, I I'm I'm not worried. You know, it's yeah. been going along well enough that we're going to get to twelve thousand, and that'll get. That's the last two folks. So, mm -hmm. um, and those are um, those are ones that uh, a, a lot of people didn't even really know about until 
I kind of kept those in my hip pocket for the for the Kickstarter because yeah. they're they're a little bit weirder and out there. Animants are um, animate objects brought to life by magic. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you've ever wanted to play Lumiere, Beauty and the Beast, now you can. Um, and uh, uh, paragons are uh, like unique sapient members of animal species um, who are sort of kind of act as like the guardians of that species. So the way I've been describing it is like if Aslan, the lion from Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe was just the king of the lions and not, not also like a Christ figure or something. Mm-hmm. Um, if he was just like, oh, he's this, you know, here's this lion that can talk and he kind of speaks on behalf of all other lions and he's their leader and very important to them. That's a paragon. Um, I think there's a few examples of that in um, Tolkien's work, like the like the um, Lord of All Horses. Uh, you you could argue that Shadowfax is is a paragon. Yeah, he's not just a really good horse. He's the Lord of Horses. He's the king of all of them. Mm-hmm. But with the, with all that in mind, I do want to th- once again thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity, inclu- including braving the hell that is time zones. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for being. Uh, we had to do some rescheduling, so thank you, Mildred, for uh, for being flexible and uh, and adjusting as things uh, sometimes get a little hectic. Yeah, for, fortunately, I al- I always try and keep um, some sort of backup plan in in place um, because as as I think I think Captain Cold and the Flash had had said it best about planning. There are four rules you need to remember. Make the plan, execute the plan, expect the plan to go off the rails, throw away the plan. Sure. <laughs> um, but anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>